My name is Joshua Holo. Welcome to the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, Jack H. Skirball Campus here in Los Angeles, and the College Commons, where we meet you, our synagogues, to discuss the most pressing topics of the day. And today, I'm very pleased to be here joined with my friend, colleague, leader in the Jewish Los Angeles community, and indeed the civic community at large, David Lehrer. David Lehrer is the president of Community Advocates Incorporated, a Los Angeles-based human uh, public relations relation, I'm sorry, human relations organization, forgive me, chaired by our former mayor, Richard Reardon. For 27 years, David served locally with the Anti-Defamation League, both as council and as its regional director. We've asked David to join us today to discuss the matter of anti-Semitism, specifically roots and reality. David, thank you very much for joining My us. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. The roots of anti-Semitism are born together with Judaism itself. Back in the ancient world, when Judaism understood itself to be a monotheistic faith in contradistinction to the polytheism that surrounded it in every direction, Judaism was born as a contentious proposition. That contentious nature of our relationship with majority populations is built in to the minority dissenting quality of Judaism. It's part of our DNA, and it's part of the DNA of others' relationship with us. As a result, Anti-Semitism or anti-Judaism has taken shape largely in relation to a majority that views a minority as sometimes standoffish, sometimes disengaged, parochial. We've all been called clannish before. There is a reality in which anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism bores down into the relationship with Jews and majority cultures, being a part of those cultures and yet being a part. Christianity over the centuries certainly exacerbated this tension by appropriating our story for a completely different story, often in direct conflict, certainly in Europe, culminating, as we all know, in the 20th century with the Holocaust. And I would like to invite David to please comment, if you would, briefly on what is the nature of America in the second half of the 20th century that has shifted the very being of Jewish in a larger minority. First of all, in the larger context, the fact that Vatican II took place in the mid-60s, which changed the attitude of the Vatican, of the Catholic Church with over a billion uh, members, and how they viewed Jews as uh, their older brothers as opposed to having, been a supplant, having supplanted Judaism, number one. Number two, the creation of Israel in 1948 was a seminal event which changed Jews' view of themselves and in the larger world. In the context of the United States in particular, set against that background, the fact is, America has always been different. I mean, I think it bears rereading George Washington's letter to the Newport, Rhode Island synagogue. It is as clear and as moving a statement on religious tolerance as one could ever hope to see. So America was different. But in the last 50 years, America has transformed itself. Uh, the Supreme Court decisions with regard to whether we are a Judeo-Christian or a Judeo-Christian or a, 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 multi, a diverse religious community, the Supreme Court decisions were absolutely important with regard to the First Amendment rights and tolerance. That, I think, changed how we viewed ourselves and our place in American society. And most, uh, basically, the attitude of how America views diversity and minorities, the passage of the 64 Civil Rights Act transformed a lot of that. And attitudinally, Americans have become simply just more tolerant of groups that are different and accepting and indeed embracing of differences and diversity. So let's talk a little bit about the relationship of the acceptance, the attitudes of non-Jewish America to Jews in America today. Well, the Pew, study, the Pew Center has done studies, and I suspect shockingly to a lot of people, uh, the results were that Jews are the most admired um, religion in America. Uh, both Protestants and Catholics view Jews as the most favorably. Then the list goes down to Catholics and on and on, down to Muslims at about 40 percent. Jews are at about 63 percent favorably. So the terms of acceptance. Uh, Jews are seen as a model kind of religion and a model community. In terms of, I think, perhaps the most fundamental uh, transformation is 
Americans' general acceptance of the notion that there are multiple pathways to heaven. It's not Shias wanting to kill Sunnis or Sunnis wanting to kill Shia because their view is somehow blasphemous or betrayal of uh, someone else's uh, notions of uh, heaven and, and the afterlife and how the world ought to be lived, and life ought to be lived. It's, there's a majority of Americans who believe that there are multiple pathways to heaven, which I think is a fundamental transformation of how religions interact in a society. If I think that you're following your path and you can make it to heaven and I'll follow my path and I don't have to impose my views on you or you on me. So you're discussing, you're, ch you're changing the discussion. You're proposing that America has changed the discussion, whereas I set up a history of tension between a majority that sees a minority um, not fully engaged with it and in some ways pushing it away and likewise the minority viewing the majority as being suspicious of it and having all kinds of tensions. You're telling me that in today in America, according to the Pew Research at least and other evidence you no doubt have at your disposal, America views Judaism as part of itself. It does. And you know, th 35 years ago, when I started, 40 years ago when I started with ADL, American studies of uh, the anti-defamation, seminal studies of anti-Semitism in America found about 30% of Americans harbored, according to the scale of anti-Semitic beliefs, harbored anti-Semitic beliefs. That's down to 10 or 12%. What are some of those beliefs that are cited as anti-Semitic? Jews prefer money over friends. The Jews are more loyal to Israel than the United States. Jews are unscrupulous in business. I mean, the scale itself is, has been questioned yeah. how, how legitimate it is. That it hasn't, it hasn't really been updated in the past 45 years, which it probably should have been. But in any event, if you take that as a measure, and it's been a constant in terms of the questions that are asked, it's been reduced from 30 percent to, to about 10 or 12 percent in the space of 40 years, which is quite amazing. All right, so Amer American Jews are successful we're light-skinned, we speak good English. There's a lot of reasons why you could imagine we can bridge that gap. And, admittedly, American society has willingly opened it up for us to enter. Mm -hmm. But part of the Jewish tradition is to link its own well-being to that of the least well-off group in its midst. So what is our stake in other American minorities now? Our stake is uh, what it has always been. We're concerned about, I mean, Jews, no matter what's the famous quip of, uh, uh, you know, Jews earn like Episcopalians but vote like Puerto Ricans. You know, it was, wasn't Mayor Koch, but somebody back, he said that. So Jews have always been concerned. Of all identifiable religious groups, Jews continue to be the most overwhelmingly democratic in terms of party affiliation. So Jews are concerned. Jews tend to be quite liberal. So they're concerned about downtrodden because the Jewish values of caring about the poor and those who don't have are, I guess, almost in the DNA of most Jews. So that continues. That's not a function. That ought not be a function of whether or not you are discriminated against. How uh, non-Jews feel about Jews does not dictate what my value system should be. But does it mean that we should be concerned not from a generous point of view, but from a self-interested point of view about the plight of the, the least well-off group in America. Yeah, I think, and, you know, liberal Protestants are concerned and whether they earn uh, $2 million a year or whether they earn $60,000, they're concerned about the downtrend because it's, I think you don't have to be terribly sophisticated to understand that the nature of a society dictates what its future will be to the extent that you have great divides and the income inequality gap is a topic of great interest these days because it speaks to how how calm or how tranquil a society is if you have uh, if you don't have vast gaps in income. So there's a self interest. You don't have to be uh, you know a bleeding heart to realize that it's not healthy. Although for a liberal Protestant, uh, a liberal Protestant might conclude that you don't want great wealth disparity or inordinate dis wealth, wealth disparity because it's destabilizing. Whereas a Jew might conclude that one doesn't want terrible disparities in justice or wealth because if it's really bad in one sector, it's only a hair's breadth from us being at the bottom. It could be. I mean, you know, how you define your self-interest, whether it's ideological or theologically based or just crass, you know, uh, 
uh, utilitarianism, I don't know. But the fact is that I think the, the data show the Jews, Jews continue to be overwhelmingly democratic and liberal. I mean, to a, uh, a, a significant degree larger than any other religious group. So uh, we've retained many of our signal values, both religiously and politically, in the American uh, discussion. Right. Um, but you argue that we still cleave, perhaps unduly, to the, uh, the what's called the lacrimose story, the tearful story of the Jews, the, the shrine gewalt, as we've called yeah. it, uh, too much, that our fears have now outstripped our reality. Yeah, I think it is very easy, uh, and it tends to be across the board uh, among uh, minority groups, to cling to a notion of victimization because it, it kind of ennobles you, it kind of absolves you of more responsibility for what you do because you're being harassed or discriminated against. Uh, and let me make clear, I am not suggesting that there isn't anti-Semitism. I'm not suggesting that there aren't cases of discrimination. Clearly that's the case. What I'm saying is that in terms of acceptance of the, on the American Seen. The Amer Jews are accepted to a degree that I think our grandparents could never have conceived. Uh, we are involved in the political process. We're involved in the socioeconomic process. We've been heads of major Fortune, uh, Fortune 100 companies like Jews have never been before. I mean, you can go down the list. And in terms of acceptance, as I said before, Jews are the most admired religious group. Uh, discrimination cases are few and far between. And we, we can publish audits of anti-Semitic incidents from now till the cows comes home, come home. But in a nation of 350 million people, a hundred, a couple hundred incidents are not exactly, you know, uh, news making events. So we the reality is we're accepted. The question is, do we look for the dark lining in every cloud? And I can tell you anecdotally from my own experience, if you speak to Jewish groups of people over 60, you can tell them all the good news. You can tell them how America has transformed itself vis-a-vis -vis the LGBT community, which is quite phenomenal in the and space of 20 fast, years. Yeah, yeah. Very fast, and it's just, you, they'll say, yes, scratch your head, and they'll say, yes, that's true. You can tell them how America has been transformed vis-a-vis -vis the African-American community in terms of what it was like 45 years ago when a black family would want to travel from L.A. to Chicago. They have to figure out 60 years ago where they could stay in hotels and motels that would accept blacks in the terms of Jim Crow and so on and so forth. And then you tell them about Jews, and they say, oh, no, 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 Jews in Germany felt comfortable. Of course, you know, the analogy doesn't hold, but it's hard to convince people that who are living in the wake only 70 years of the greatest trauma in the history of its people, when six million people, men, women, and children were killed, that, you know, there is no Hitler on the horizon in America, the Cossacks aren't coming, and the sky isn't falling. It's, it's hard to say that, you know, it doesn't mean it can happen. There are no guarantees in life. But it should be that we live life as, as America has presented it to us, which is quite extraordinary. The Jewish population is divided overwhelmingly between the state of Israel and the United States, with significant smaller populations, particularly in France, uh, England, Argentina. Yeah. Uh, it's appropriate that we should feel solidarity with our brethren the world over. I think you'll agree. Yes. Uh, is one of the narratives here that we are conflating the American experience with the, for example, French experience out of that solidarity, but perhaps not out of an analytical clarity. Yeah, I think it's very easy. I mean, I could give a speech tomorrow about the, the terrible anti-Semitism in Europe, the terrible anti-Semitism in North Africa and the Middle East. Uh, and then kind of slip into talking about America and pick a few examples and say, well, it's pretty bad here. And it just, I think it's absurd. There are problems, serious problems in Europe. They, and the ADL published a study earlier this year about anti-Semitism worldwide. And it's about if you, 29% harbor anti-Semitic beliefs. And if you take out the Middle East and North Africa, I think it's 24, 25%, which is a serious issue. Uh, but that's not America. And I think the... The failure to uh, disaggregate facts and data about the United States and about some parts of Western Europe 
and the rest of the world is just a, it's just a mistake and it misleads the American Jewish public. I mean, it's very easy to be a chicken little, say the sky's falling, and raise a lot of money and uh, get people very excited. But I think it's, it's fundamentally dishonest. Well, let's talk about the relationship between dis Let's assume there's a dishonesty there that rather than a, a, a sincere misread mm -hmm. on the part of some, at least. Uh, if the chicken little narrative works, if it raises money for the Jewish people, if it ends up protecting Jewish interests within the confines of civil discourse and, 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 and democratic assumptions, who's to say that's not the way to go? It's not the most effective way to advance our agenda. I think it's inaccurate, number one. Why, why is it inaccurate? I think because it's not true. I think the fact is America Wait. Jews are are in a very good place. Oh, it, the, 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 the posture is based on inaccurate. Facts. Inaccurate, number okay, one. So on the one number hand, it doesn't two, reflect reality. Right, but number, it doesn't reflect reality. Strategically, I think, number you know, you cry wolf too often when you really have a problem, people aren't going to pay attention. And, and number three, you run the risk of alienating a large cohort of the American Jewish community. Millennials are tolerant. They don't see anti-Semitism as uh, that the Cossacks are coming and the pogroms around the corner. Millennials make up 95 million young Americans, and a nice percentage of those uh, of the American Jewish public are millennials. You give them that message, they will turn you off quicker than they'll turn off uh, a running tap water in the period of drought. It's just, it doesn't resonate with young people. It may resonate with people 65 and older, perhaps, but it doesn't resonate with young people because they can see it. it they don't experience it in their own lives. You know, my generation may have experienced some anti-Semitism. I talk to my kids, they haven't experienced anti-Semitism in college, they haven't experienced it in employment, they haven't experienced it in their social interactions with their peers. It's like a historical phenomenon that they understand and they are rightfully concerned about. But it's not, it's not a reality that they see around them. And to try and convince them of that is like, you know, lots of luck, but it's not gonna work. I wanna welcome all of you to please Send in your questions or comments to us directly in real time at uh, Twitter, at College Commons, or you can email to collegecommons at huc.edu. That's Twitter, at College Commons, or email at collegecommons at huc.edu. We'll be taking your questions live and presenting them uh, directly to David Lehrer. There is a natural sense of not only solidarity, but authenticity. That is to say, we are raised in this narrative that I briefly, briefly outlined in the beginning of an appreciation of attention, sometimes downright conflict, at the end of which we should be landing in our own camp with our own people protecting our own interests. What's going on with that emotional pull towards the anti-Semitic narrative in relation to a new message? Well, I think it, it's not particularly useful or helpful for the Jewish people to, have, to depend on anti-Semitism as, as the glue that binds them together. That ought not be the reason we are together. The Holocaust is, is history, uh, and it clearly had a deep impact on, the Ameri on Jewish communities worldwide. But what binds us together and what should impel us forward is concern about Judaism, about continuity, about educating young people, and inculcating them with why they ought to be. I mean, if you're ultra-Orthodox or very Orthodox, there's no question. You do this, and you, that's part of being Jewish is continuing the rituals. But if you're conservative or reform and unaffiliated, you have to be, there is, we ought to be Compel, we ought to be working hard to convince young people why in a society where no one's going to punish them for being Jewish or they can move out to the boonies and be whatever they want, why there's a value in being Jewish. What are the intrinsic benefits to them of a value system that goes back 3,000 years that has value and merit in the 21st century world? I can only take this as a constructive challenge to all of us in Reform Synagogues and here at the Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, to create that culture, right. to inculcate our leaders and our congregants with a knowledge, an awareness, 
a love, a passion uh, to realize those things. Right. Uh, and, it, it, and it shouldn't be contingent upon somebody saying you're a dirty Jew. I mean, if that's the reason you're in, uh, right. adhering to the Jewish community, I'm not sure it's particularly helpful to anybody. This is an argument that has been developed in the last uh, 20 years. The Holocaust isn't enough to define the Jewish people, and uh, it need not be enough because we have plenty right. more. Of and it. that's why acknowledging the diminishing role of anti-Semitism in American society today should not impact how we view ourselves, how we view the challenges. There are lots of challenges in the world out there to Jews and to, and to, and to our continuity, but they're not a, in, in the United States, they're not a function of anti-Semites. They're a function of our lack of interest, our lack of education competency, our lack of carrying on traditions that are meaningful. The issue of that attack, that, um, that, that negativity that you are arguing has diminished, uh, I'm not arguing the data indicate has Fair enough. You're illustrating yes. that it's been diminished. Uh, it, I think does resonate with a lot of us in many ways. I think most of us benefit from realities that reflect that data. So far, so good. There's one place where I think the American Jewish conversation, particular, particularly in mm -hmm. relation to the non-Jewish majority and internally at the same time, is the American Zionist discussion, the American Jewish Zionist discussion, and the American non-Jewish Zionist discussion. I personally feel, uh, mostly indirectly, but not completely indirectly, you gave anecdotal examples before, where that, um, that well-being is not the experience, where there's much more tension. And I'd like to bring a specific question from uh, Rabbi Linda Burtenthal, from Congregation Beth David in San Luis Obispo, who asks the following. Yes. What about the Israel bashing that is so prevalent on our college campuses and in many liberal churches reflects a double standard? Do you see any anti-Semitism in the boycott sanctions movement uh, or in uh, the politics towards Israel in general? Sure, there is some anti-Semitism, but you know, I think it'd be naive to, th to not acknowledge that some of that is in response to the situation in the Middle East, the actions of the Israeli government, and the response to that, which has been just pilloried in the press, the Gaza war. So all of those events and the lack of progress contribute to a uh, a nasty reaction against Israel. Some of it is clearly anti-Semitic. In England, when they boycott, when they urge markets to boycott uh, the boycott movement to not have goods from from manufactured in Israel or the West Bank, that spilled over into banning kosher goods. So there's always an element, not always, there's frequently an element of anti-Semitism as well. But I think to Describe college campuses as you know rife with anti-Israel activity. There are campuses, some campuses that are, in fact, a problematic. Whether it's Berkeley or San Jose State or San Francisco State and perhaps Columbia, some of those campuses have historically been sites of a lot of activism. But I can tell you, for having been in those wars, 1982 when Israel was in Lebanon, and the late 70s, early and through the mid 80s. College campuses were much more hostile and nasty, and third world coalitions developed that were inimical to the interests of Jewish students. The stuff today is problematic, it's, it's nasty, it can be challenging from uh, periodically and episodically, but the reality is this is a golden age for Jewish students on American campuses. It's for the Jewish community. You have Jewish administrators where you never had administrators, where you have so many Jewish professors, and you have non-Jewish students taking Jewish studies courses in, in enormous degrees. So the cup can be half full or half empty. It's irritating. And I think actually it goes back to one of your prior questions. One of the reasons we get so many complaints on, from Jewish students on colleges, campuses, is because they come so unprepared. They're so unschooled. They don't know how to debate the Middle East. They don't know how to respond to a challenge from an, uh, either an Arab student or from a hard left student about Israel and, and why it does what it does or why it doesn't do what it should do. Um, those, so they come back and they come back to their mommies and daddies and say they've been harassed. Well, you know, college is supposed to be challenging. And the good news about the crisis on college campuses is, you know, 18-year-olds eventually mature and grow up, and they'll grow out of the, you know, the, the nastiness and the fervor and the extremism that manifests itself frequently on college campuses. 
Well, I do want us to rise to the challenge that you pose. I take it very, very seriously that we have, as the leaders of the Jewish community, a task before us, which is to prepare our children and our families to be able to celebrate Judaism, as you said, and to be able to engage meaningfully and powerfully in the Zionist discussion. I received a specific question from Ann Cheslaw at University Synagogue here in Los Angeles uh, for a clarification. Say hello to Ann for me. An old friend. You can, you can say yourself. It's, we're, uh, we're all here in the big living room of the uh, virtual world, and uh, she requested that I clarify um, uh, my intro about anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism. Anti-Semitism is effectively a 19th century phenomenon whereby the pseudosciences of racial sciences and uh, uh, phrenology and uh, measuring people's skulls uh, created uh, hierarchies of races. And one of the races was the Semites in which the Jews belonged. And this was a deeply, deeply racial argument. The reason I insist on distinguishing between anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism is because anti-Judaism is something that is co-phenomenal with Judaism itself. It's a very ancient thing. Pre-Christian writers in the Roman world were put off by the fact that Jews wouldn't eat pork with them. And this made them feel that we were standoffish, and the Jews felt that they were overweening and insistent on their culture without any regard for the Jewish body politic or body religious. The consequence is that anti-Judaism developed in the Christian world as a way of saying Jews are misanthropic. And these were some of the questions to which David referred in those classic anti-Semitic uh, measurement tests. Do Jews prefer to make money over making friends? That question is packed with a specific kind of hatred to a culture that stands tall and stands tall in its difference. That difference and the majority's approach to that difference, in our case, is anti-Judaism regardless of anti-Semitism. The two, however, have conflated quite a bit. The, uh, the Der Sturmer pictures of hooked-nosed Jews stealing Christian babies is classic from the anti-Semitic uh, uh, press of the day. In the modern uh, world of, of, of uh, Arab anti-Israel sentiment and anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism, these things collide and coalesce, and it's a mess. It's very complicated. I think there are different sensibilities. In America today, I don't think racial anti-Semitism has much currency. I don't think anti-Judaism has much currency. But when we confront negative feelings about Jews, it's mostly these anti-Jewish feelings. It's not because people feel that we are racially inferior. I think it's because they feel that Jews uh, have uh, commitments that they don't trust to the degree anti-Judaism exists. And Israel is one of them, especially on the far left or amongst people who, for perfectly cogent reasons, favor the Palestinian side of the story or the anti-Israel side, however you put it. So, Anne, I hope I clarified it a little bit. It only gets more complicated. To be fair to David, David's talking about the American experience right. and specifically how the standoffishness culturally with Jews and non-Jews has shifted radically particularly since uh, the end of uh, World War II, I think it's fair to say. Should we be concerned about this summer's events in Europe vis-a-vis -vis historic anti-Semitism or perhaps anti-Judaism or both? A question from Rabbi Daniel Weiner from Temple to Hirsch Sinai in Seattle, Washington. Well, events in Europe are, uh, have been awful. Uh, and uh, there's a degree to which it's inspired by a lot of Muslim immigrants in Europe. Uh, but it's also the fact of the Gaza war and the, the drubbing that Israel took in the press worldwide. It's not a terrible shock to realize it, to, to suspect that a lot of the demonstrations and the nastiness were, were, was a function of what went on in the Middle East. Um, and Europe continues, and the polls show, continues to be a real, really problematic. There are Jewish communities that are virtually seem to be leaving their countries right. uh, uh, because of what has transpired. Uh, but again, I think we have to distinguish between uh, Europe and the United States. We are, a, by definition, a diverse society. We are a nation of immigrants, and we have just... Uh, 
We are the sui generis. Have a similar narrative, though, about yes, they're an old world country with a rooted population, but they have uh, vast immigrant populations. But part, they have part of which are, are causing the problem in France, by right. the way, for the Jews. But the French attitude towards immigrants has been very different. The American attitude towards immigrants was. You, wherever you come from, you become an American. You have to take a citizenship test to become an American. You're supposed to know. I remember my grandparents who came here. They were 60 years old. And they knew every amendment to the Constitution because they had to learn them to take the citizenship test. The French adopted a notion in the mid 60s after the civil rights, after the riots in America. They think maybe that notion of assimilation doesn't work very well. We'll let all these groups kind of maintain their identity and their the mosaic their, model. Yeah, and it apparently hasn't worked very well. Uh, and very few people come to the United States saying, well, I'm from uh, Somalia, I'm going to stay a Somalian, and I don't really want to come to me. You come to America, you really want to become an American, for the most part. I mean, there are obviously exceptions. And you kind of breathe in the ethos, and your kids become American. That's what's actually so disturbing about the recent case of these young girls from Somalia, uh, Somalian bo American born, but Somalia went back to one of Mary Isis guys in, yeah. in Syria. The, apparently, the uh, FBI is very, uh, is really troubled about that because there was no indication. They didn't quite understand, harking back to something that for which there really aren't many precedents. It's, that's troubling, but uh, I'm not sure how widespread it is. So uh, you're asking us to view the French experience, particularly of anti-Semitism right now, anti-Judaism right now, as something that's unlikely to cross the pond, as they say. You don't think that it's we're, a different we're attitude towards them. Look, you could be a third generation Turkish immigrant, you can be a German, and they, you will still be viewed as a Turk in Germany. You can be a recent immigrant from Austria and become the governor of the state of California. There's just a different attitude towards immigrants and how you become American. There's a very contentious and uh, heated debate about immigrants and immigration policy in the United States. But the general notion is that you come to America, you can become an immigrant. You buy, play by the rules. You're as American as, as, uh, as Betsy Ross and apple pie. That is not the case in many European cultures, where it's a citizenship of blood, not of you know your, your Frenchman going back three centuries as opposed to a recent, Im uh, not even a recent immigrant. You could be third generation Turk and you're still viewed as a Turk. I, I don't think that applies to France. That might apply to some countries like well, uh, the, the Japan. But uh, in France, they have a very lively immigrant population. They do have a, a lively, but they're, they're lively still immigrant viewed stores. as immigrants. So your view, Arnold Schwarzenegger is viewed as an American, and he came here 30 years yes, ago. He's viewed as both, and he, but, but he's granted a lot of latitude. And you're right. I mean, there are differences, and there's different. Look, the new world is a different world, and we're all immigrants. And that, the, you, you quoted in a recent posting of yours uh, the, the, uh, the Tom Friedman uh, article right. where he uh, celebrates our motto, a pluribus unum, out of many, one. And the sense that somehow American society has actually begun to live up to that. What a notion. Yeah, it's extraordinary. And, I, and the, the sad part uh, of what I do is that you see people who just aren't willing to accept it, who want to look for the dark lining in the cloud. You know, Plato said, I can forgive an adult who, a child who's afraid of the dark, but I can't accept an adult who's afraid of the light. <laughs> So the French, uh, it, it granting that there is an ocean between us, a history of, uh, of, of, of immigrant relations, which is genuinely different. Nevertheless, uh, in France, uh, people are worried about France, and we're getting questions. Uh, France has become the poster child for the classic anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic story that the Jews cause problems, that the Jews are a negative presence, etc. And people want to know the difference between Muslim anti-Judaism and Christian anti-Judaism in, uh, in France, perhaps in general. In America, perhaps, we do have some of these very troubling Somali cases, for example. Is something afoot? Uh, in America? Either. Uh, well, you know, I'm not an expert on Muslim anti-Semitism in, in Europe. Uh, but it's clearly problematic, and it's clearly not just the anti-Semitism, but Muslim uh, recent immigrants' attitudes towards democracy and the and the functioning of democracy are problematic in much of Europe and in England as well, and Scandinavia. So I think some of those chickens are coming home to roost in terms of opening the borders and, and what the EU. The, the, I mean, the British may even pull out of the EU because of immigration.
immigration issues and what it portends. But I think there was a very positive sign the past week in America with regard to the American Muslim community when two national leaders of uh, Muslim, the Muslim Public Affairs Council, which is one of the major Muslim groups in America, wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, which took a good deal of courage uh, to say that what they see overseas with regard to the Muslim uh, theology and ideology is terribly disturbing. It has become extreme and fundamentalist and intolerant of divisions and diversity. And they think that it, there is a time, it's maybe uh, a bit overdue, but they th are calling for a reformation of Islam and that it ought to emanate from the American Muslim community, which has the capacity to transform, uh, hopefully, they think, Islam because it has accepted diversity and dissension and, and, a, and a, the, the historical processes of, of Islam, which was to question and not to take texts at, you know, texts from a thousand years ago at their literal as if, uh, if basis, even as they if were it, getting it right literally in the first right. place. So you're saying that the American population, the American experience of Muslims in some ways might mirror our experience. Maybe. I'm, I mean, this is clearly a, right, a first uh, yes, yes. little light. Uh, a, but uh, it's, it's, these are two important guys in the Muslim community, in, and hopefully that there'll be some resonance. God and will. the fact that they were willing to put that in writing in the Wall Street Journal suggests that they seem may see the tide changing within the uh, body politic right. of American, American Muslims. The American Muslim population is still not very large compared to the world, but it has all kinds of advantages that we've spoken about. I'd like in this precisely this vein to read a question from Rabbi Dara Frimmer of Temple Isaiah here in Los Angeles. Uh, you've talked about the ways anti-Semitism has been reduced in the United States, yeah. thanks to the Supreme Court, Vatican II, civil rights, etc. Does this mean that a resurgence is highly unlikely? And more to your last point, now that we've set up enough social and political infrastructure to move forward and not backslide, or at least reasonably not, not fear backsliding, can our American experience, now that we've argued that the European experience probably won't necessarily corrupt or infect our American experience yeah. in this regard, can we do the converse? Is it possible that our American experience can teach us about how to address anti-Semitism in Europe? Okay, well, let me go to the latter question first. I suspect it might, but it's not terribly likely. There are different different ethos. Uh, many years ago, the Anti-Defamation League wanted to set up an office in Paris to function as an anti. This was probably 77, 78, 79. And they realized that the French Jewish community just didn't operate within the body politic of France the way the American Jewish community operated here. And I think similarly in England, although with the Board of Deputies, there may be a closer analogy. So they're just, they function differently. Uh, they feel um, a part of the of the body politic differently than we do here. We are not afraid to raise our voices and to be uh, as loud and as obnoxious as we want to be, and we don't fear the consequences. With regard to the first part of the question, was, resurgence. Yeah, I just don't see it. I mean, there's a seminal piece that Leon Wieseltier wrote in the New Republic about ten years ago, and the headline was the title was Hitler is dead, uh, and he said, and I happen to agree 100 percent, there are no guarantees in life. You know, when I speak to Jewish groups and the group is over 65, inevitably someone will say, well, you know, the German Jews felt comfortable and look what happened. And that's true, but I don't think we're, and that what we live is in any way analogous to what Germany was like in the 20s and 30s, number one. And number two, you know, in Los Angeles, we know there's going to be an 8.5 earthquake sometime, but we don't walk around with the with crash helmets on because that's just a risk in life. There are no guarantees in life, but if you look on the horizon and the foreseeable future, the Cossacks aren't coming, there's not a pogrom around the corner, and American Jews continue to be as accepted as any minority group in history has been anywhere in the world. Now, if we choose to be glum and dour and look through, look at this world through a prism of fear, it's our loss, not anybody else's, and I think it's a terrible mistake. I think what we have to do is realize there's always a potential, that there aren't any guarantees. We keep our eyes and ears open, but we live our lives as full participants in the American scene and enjoy and try and reap the bounty of this amazing country. Going back to the American discussion on Israel, uh, another question from Rabbi Linda Burtenthal. She's busy this morning. Yeah, that's right. Drink uh, some coffee, Linda. <laughs> San Luis Obispo. Uh, she asks, uh, 
you referred to how Israel is pilloried in the press. Uh, I agree. In contrast, attacks on Israeli civilians do not receive similar press uh, here in the United States. For example, the recent terrorist attack in Jerusalem that killed a baby girl was first reported under a headline that Israeli police had shot a Palestinian man. Should we not be concerned about the anti-Israel slant in the American press? I don't think the American press is slanted anti-Israel. Uh, I think they will take a headline and make a headline and run with a story wherever they can. I think our fears about the uh, American public opinion may be genuine, but the fact is America remains, American people remain overwhelmingly supportive of Israel. If you look at any polls over time, the support for Israel ranges between 45 and 49 percent, depending on the circumstances, and support for the Palestinian ranges between 7 and 10 percent, depending on the headlines, too. So it goes up or down depending on the circumstances, but Americans remain by a margin of 4 to 1 generally supportive of Israel. It can go up, it can go down, but it's pretty constant and pretty supportive. Headlines, you know, you can drive yourself crazy if you uh, worry about this headline or that headline, but the press tends to be generally sympathetic if skeptical from time to time. Uh, Bibi Netanyahu can be a difficult uh, a personality, but he gets an awful lot of press. Uh, and if anything, most of the critics say that the America's in the thrall of Israel and the Israel lobby, uh, not that uh, America is unsympathetic to Israel. Which may be just as problematic for your thesis. Yes, as the, it's problematic, but, yeah. uh, but that's a lot of overseas. Mainly, that's mainly relegated to the extremes here in America. But you read uh, press overseas, they'll talk about Israel, uh, Israel and the Israel lobby having a stranglehold over American foreign I policy. Know. No, no, I know. I encounter it all the time. I have another question um, from Seattle, Kimberly Stevens at Temple to Hirsch Sinai. Um, I'm going to, uh, rather than uh, refer back to my own definition of anti-Semitism, I'm going to pose this question to you uh, when she asks, what is the definition of anti-Semitism? I'd like you, uh, from your experience in the ADL, to, to, to give us a technical definition of how one approaches that. Um, and there's a second question which I think is important for us to consider, um, which uh, she asks, what about the alienation in America due to people threatened by those who do not believe in Jesus. And I'm going to infer here, Kimberly, that you mean those cases where people refer to the fact that America is a Christian country and people um, sense that non-Christianity um, diminishes Americanism. So these are two very different questions, but I think they're both very important. So for the first one, please uh, give us your working definition of anti-Semitism. Well, uh, it's a little bit like Justice Potter Stewart on the Supreme Court when asked in one of his opinions to define pornography, he says, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. It's not easy to define it, given the, the, the uh, anti-Zionism and anti-Israel and anti-Semitism, where one washes over into the other is very hard to define. But if, essentially, if you're denying to the Jewish people in term, this is in the political context, the right to the, a nation and to live uh, lives that you grant to every other people in the world, that becomes anti-Semitic. If you're criticizing Israel for policies on the West Bank or Bibi Netanyahu for what he did on Monday or Tuesday, that may probably is anti, may, may be legitimate political discussion and discourse as opposed to anti-Semitism. But yeah, each case is kind of sui generis and it's hard to, I can't give you a broad definition that will be ironclad and a yardstick against which you measure. measure. It's a very murky, uh, tough field, but the example I cited before in England, where they went from wanting to ban products from the West Bank in Israel to banning kosher uh, food and market as a sign of their solidarity with the Palestinians was going from anti-Zionism to anti-Semitism and clearly unacceptable. Not to mention the halal meat that uh, whatever Muslims right. uh, lost access yes. to with right. losing access. Now, what was the second question? The second question had to do with the, um, again, as I read the question, the, um, the, that aspect of American culture that is threatened by oh. non-Christianity. Uh, yeah, but that's such a small segment of extremists who think that uh, you know, the, the guy who used to scream at the funerals for uh, gay 
uh, for gay uh, people who died from AIDS, the guy from the Midwest that passed. There are, there are those folks out there, but they're really relegated to the fringes of American society, and it's not part of the common discourse of American society. I mean, if you're in a country really? where... Even in, in the Republican right, where they, uh, they have to pander, frankly, no, to... No, they don't. It's just... It, I, you'd really have to search to find the kind of notion that this is a Christian country that shouldn't tolerate minority religions. And it's not that they say they shouldn't tolerate uh, minority religions. They don't have to go that far. They simply say that they get to set the agenda by virtue of defining the enterprise itself. Well, you know, but then not, have not been very successful. How was it? 36 uh, straight court decisions that say you can have gay marriage? I mean, if, if they think they can define the political agenda, they certainly have been very successful, especially on something. If you talk about questioning fundamentalist religious views of the Christian right, gay marriage is certainly like at the core of under, undercutting uh, their notions of how the world ought to be. And they certainly haven't been very successful. So the fringe exists. It will always exist. I mean, the interesting underlying question, the subtext of these questions, what's your measure of, of success in living in American society? If your measure of success is the elimination of nutcases and anti-Semites and, and nativists and nasty folk, then we'll never, they will always be there. There will always be hate crimes. There will always be nasty folks out there. The question is, are we enabled, are we allowed to live our lives where we can work where we want, we can live where we want, we can go to school where we want, and our success is only limited by our ambition and our desire to do well? That, I think, is the case. Will we be irritated? Will we be challenged? Will there be nasty folks? Of course, but that shouldn't alter the fact that there aren't laws that somehow impinge upon our right to pursue what we'd like to pursue, to study what we want. You know, Maimonides has a very kind of uh, applicable and apropos notion of paradise, of uh, after the Messiah comes, where we'll be able, people will be able to study and pursue what they want to pursue, and peace will kind of reign supreme. He doesn't talk about lambs laying down with lions. Well, his notion of what what it was like after the Messiah comes is not all that different from the kind of world we're living in today, in America at least, where you can pursue your dreams, you can study all day if you want, you can work all day, you can be religious, you can be a-religious, you can marry whom you want, you can live it, your life as you pursue it. It's, it's, it's pretty damn good. A member of the community in uh, uh, San Luis Obispo, Temple Beth David, asks, uh, if you see the Israel coverage in the New York Times as uh, either particularly favorable or fair or perhaps unfavorable? How, how would you rate? I think it's generally favorable. I think the headlines have been problematic, which used to be a serious problem with the LA Times. Whoever was writing the headlines, especially in the LA Times, used to be on Monday mornings. Whoever wrote the headlines on, the, on Sunday really uh, had a problem. That You read the article, they were accurate and fair, but the headlines somehow slanted. So you know that the writer of the headlines is not the author of the piece. Right. Is it? And I think that may be more problematic at the in New York. The New York Times, clearly, the editorials tilt left of center. They've been quite critical of Israel. But I don't think that goes to whether they are in, inherently supportive of the existence of the state of Israel. They criticize policies and ra rather vigorously of the Netanyahu government, but not any more critical than labor uh, is in the, in, the, in the halls of the Knesset. So it's, it's not over the edge, but it can be irritating, it can be um, uh, viewed as problematic from time to time, but the New York Times is clearly not biased against the state of Israel. Julie Salton of Temple Beth Torah here in Ventura. An old friend. Asks, how do we get through to millennials to strengthen their Jewish identity? This may be the best vaccine against anti-Semitism. That is, a strongly American Jewish identity amongst our younger generation. I think that's the challenge. I think millennials, because they are the most tolerant generation ever po uh, polled, and there are 95 million of them, they are just off the charts in terms of tolerance. They have multiple friends that are different than themselves. I mean, they are just, they're the most accepting, they're liberal, their attitudes on, on uh, uh, gay marriage, on acceptance of uh, right. sexual orientation, are just off the charts. They're already done with that. Yeah. And they are a group that the, I think is a real challenge for the Jewish community to figure out how to appeal to them, how to make Judaism relevant to them, how to make it something that they want to impart to their kids. And I think 
sometimes the, the alarmist attitude and analyses of polls, of attitudes of, of, of Jews and the, the Pew poll of a couple years ago, doesn't always take into account once uh, young people have kids. It, there's a transformation that takes place once you have kids. All of a sudden, right. you're thinking about your future. You're thinking about what are they right. going to transmit in terms of values. You can be wild and crazy and um, uh, unaffiliated yes. when, when you're single, but suddenly you have kids. It's different. So I think there's a window now with millennials starting to have kids to really get them. And I think, you know, one of the, the expense of synagogue life, the expense of wanting to send your kids to a Jewish day school or to a nursery school, it's very very expensive, and I think that's something the Jewish community has. It's not my. It's it's beyond my pay grade. That's not what that's I'm an job. expert in. But being a grandparent and the father of uh, four kids and four grandkids, I can see what the, what the expenses are for young people today that's if true. they want to be involved. It's not. It's not insignificant. Right. The economics of this question become uh, paramount for most families. Right. That's right. Uh, but it changes with kids, and they make different choices. Uh, we have a question about the nature of being Jewish with respect to anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. Is it part of our DNA? Are we, do we need to have that, what I think you might call hypersensitivity, at least in the United States, to uh, threats? Is that, f that antennae, even if, it, even if it leads to a misapprehension of reality, even if it's slightly alarmist? Isn't it part of who we are and isn't it for the best? Uh, I don't think we need a hypersensitivity. I think we need a sensitivity. I think we have to have that. That cannot be the prism through which we view the world. That should be part of the spectrum, but not the prism. If we constantly view the world as threatening and nasty and dangerous and, and, uh, and hostile to us, that's just unfortunate. There are problems, there will always be problems. Are there anti-Semites? There'll always be anti-Semites. The question is, the real measure is not, by the way, in a society like America, not whether there are anti-Semites out there. The question is, how does society respond to anti-Semitism? Do the good people speak up? Do they condemn it? Do they take action? That's the measure of where your society is. Not the fact that there are nuts out there. There are always sociopaths and crazy people. Does society take them seriously? Well, I can tell you, when I started with the ADL in 75, hate crimes were like, oh, a slap on the wrist, a kid would have to write an essay on brotherhood as a remedy. There is now a cottage industry in dealing with hate crimes. Cops take it seriously, judges take it seriously, government takes it seriously. That's a society showing that that is unacceptable behavior and we will not tolerate that kind of behavior. That's the measure of where we are and I think that's what we have to uh, respond to. What about just analytically speaking, who's to say that Americans' opinions about anti-Semitism, as opposed to Jews' opinions about anti-Semitism, are the accurate measure. If a, you, you say d d general statistics, but if the Jewish population feels that it's... But the Jewish population isn't, isn't uh, hyper-sensitive uh, and, and worried. I think most Jews live their lives hardly thinking about anti-Semitism. When an incident occurs, the, thing, the concerns will rise up, and then they'll ebb and flow. If you did a survey of American Jews, I think, I can't recall offhand some of those surveys, but Americans, American Jews feel very accepted and very uh, happy in, with their circumstances. I think it's American Jewish leadership can, from time to time, shry gewalt unnecessarily. And I'm not in any way diminishing the, the need for being concerned about anti-Semitism. I just don't think it should be the prism through which we view the world. It's gotta be, it's gotta be something that is on our radar. It, we'd be fools 70 years after the Holocaust to ignore it, but it can't be the way we view the world because it's a, it's a sad story if that's how you think uh, the world is, is looking at us. I think that's as good a place as any for us to end. Uh, I think the message is clear uh, from David Lehrer's point of view that the American Jewish situation is a special one, an extremely favorable one. And what I would like to add to this is a point that you picked up on at least twice during this interview, which is that if this is the case, all the more burden on us to succeed as citizens exactly. and neighbors and as a Jewish community in a context where antagonism does not define us. It's actually a higher bar. Right. We cannot be the victims of our success.
We have a lot to work with and a great future ahead of us. And it's been a true pleasure to talk to you. Same and to here. You. David, thank you so much for joining us. And to all of you in uh, four states, from Washington to Nevada, New Mexico, and California, thank you for joining us on the Hebrew uh, Union College Jewish Institute of Religion College Commons. I hope you look forward to meeting with your rabbis and clergy and educators with the study guides we provided so that you can continue this discussion locally on your campuses and synagogues. David, thank you again. Have a great week, and thank you for joining us.